Hi, everybody. This is Philip. I am a faculty member here at Gratz College and a graduate of the EDD program and program director for our MED and our MS in teaching practice programs. So as I like to say, uh, I teach teachers. Uh, my current research preoccupation is the life of John Dewey. And in doing that research, I came across this in interesting episode that I want to share with you today. Uh, it's only about a year in his life, his long life. Um, and it's a little gossipy. However, I think it's uh, interesting and fun and maybe instructive uh, a little bit into uh, his character. So I hope you enjoy. Thanks for watching and joining us on this uh, learn a -thon. So our story starts here in New York City in 1917, especially the Lower East Side, where there's a 37-year-old woman named Anzia Izerska, and she's a Polish-Jewish immigrant. She came to the United States in about 1819. She's a writer. She's a thinker. She's a passionate um, individual who worked extremely hard to put herself through Columbia's Teachers College. She was a seamstress and a laundress, and she cleaned houses, and she worked early in the morning and went to school and worked at night to get this degree. Now, in 1917, when we meet her and uh, start our story, she is doing some of that kind of labor, and she's trying to find a teaching job. And she finds that she keeps getting shut out of positions. She's almost like when they just look at her, right? They know, and it's this bias against her. And she's just shut out uh, of, of these. She's so frustrated. Now, one day she opens the newspaper and there she reads uh, a story about John Dewey. Now in 1917, John Dewey is already famous. He's arguably the most famous professor and American intellectual in the country. He's also not shy about speaking out or being associated with causes, whether it's marching in a parade in support of women's rights to vote uh, or publishing uh, essays um, and speaking on the importance of settlement houses as providing education and resources uh, and compassion and empathy for immigrants. In 1917, he's speaking um, in the story that Anzia reads about free speech. Three high school teachers had been fired from their position for comments that were perceived as uh, critical of the United States. Of course, at this time, this is a really, really hot issue. Um, America, should it enter the war? And once it enters the war, can you criticize the government? Can you speak uh, freely? So he's giving this talk. She says, this is the man who can help me. And apparently the next morning, she marches into his office at Columbia, past the office secretary, right into his, uh, right in front of his desk, plops herself down at the desk, and just tells her uh, entire story. She's a bold character. She is uh, fiery. And her daughter, this is her daughter writing, describes the scene. This is her daughter writing. Her intensity, the aggressive and impassioned speech, even her blouse pulled partly free of her skirt her red hair slipping out of its pompadour in wisps around her flushed face, all these unconventional traits which had so offended school principals and deans were persuasive to Dewey. Uh, it's a great passage written by her daughter about the specific scene. John Dewey is a caricature. Uh, everybody who writes about John Dewey talks about this kind of caricature of the reserved New England Yankee. Right, he's humble, he's quiet, he's always even described as dressing like a Vermont country farmer, um, slightly disheveled, but super nice and polite 
and quiet man. He's also always really attracted to larger than life, colorful personalities. That's another kind of fun thing about Dewey, whether it was Jane Adams in Chicago, whether it was the visiting uh, Maxim Gorky from about uh, about a decade before this episode, um, who was traveling the country with not his wife, but a actress. Uh, the Deweys invited them to stay, or at the same time, Dewey's also becoming friends with Philadelphia's own uh, Albert Barnes, who was the scientist slash businessman, uh, made a lot of money, bought a lot of controversial art, and loved to fight um, and spar with people uh, who disagreed with him on any position. So Dewey's taken with Anzia, there is no doubt. And he says, I will come and watch you teach. She's got the substitute teaching job. Um, he's going to give her feedback. She also leaves some of her manuscripts with him, and he says he will read her work. So he does that. He watches her teach. He reads her work, and he says to her, having watched you teach and having read your work, I think you should concentrate on your writing. Uh, and he really, really is supportive of her writing, telling her, put these stories that you're telling me into the work that you're doing. And she's uh, to the moon. She's so excited to have somebody who sees her in that way who's not pandering to her or uh, condescending to her, but saying, you need to write your story. Key work, do the work, right? Do, it's a do the work kind of advice that she can lean into uh, and tell her story. And he also, uh, the relationship is two ways because she's encouraging him. She's encouraging him to, uh, in some instances, make his academic writing more direct. And his writing is famously... Um, abstract at times and complicated at times and she's saying be more direct she's also encouraging him to write from his heart and john dewey starts writing some poetry to her about the ways you know that he's feeling she's also taking him into some of her neighborhoods in the lower east side and he's able to see uh, a different side of life that he's lost a little bit of touch with because he has at this point become um famous uh, and he helps her to laugh at her life at times and, and see some of these things that she would take so seriously as fodder for her writing or to look at the communities around her or other communities she was visiting uh, as a visitor and to see that as, as a lens um, to generate uh, material. Dewey also invites Anzia to join his seminar uh, in political philosophy that's going to start in the spring semester of 1918. And it's a really interesting course because uh, it's full of interesting people, including the future head of the philosophy department at Columbia, the future head of the philosophy department at Yale, someone who goes on to write a really important book about aesthetics, and perhaps most notably, Dr. Barnes of Philadelphia. Now, Barnes, uh, was a huge fan of Dewey's book, Democracy and Education, which had come out uh, in 1916. So still a very recent book. Barnes famously uh, gave it out to all the employees of his factory and um, organized groups to talk about the book. Uh, and he was in this class. And he always was encouraging Dewey and he really wanted to partner with Dewey and put some kind of political or not polit well, political financial uh, muscle applied learning behind Dewey's um, thoughts. Because again, by this point, Dewey was long past some of the work he'd done earlier that was his laboratory, laboratory school where he was putting his ideas into motion and actually watching them. At this point, he was... Um, really just a professor and a lecturer and a, a public intellectual in that way. So Barnes keeps thinking about this. I want to help. I want to help. And I have this great idea. And so what is the idea that he comes up with? Barnes gets Dewey to agree to work on a project over the summer with the students. That would be a course that's on the ground in Philadelphia uh, in the Port, what today is that we call the Port Richmond section of Philadelphia. Now, Barnes's interest in this neighborhood at the time was that it was a Polish community, uh, but the folks there had really resisted any kind of outreach or attempts to 
uh, assimilate in with the um, community or even start making stronger ties to the community. So he wanted to study that. It's a really interesting uh, idea of a course, uh, an early example of experiential learning or a community-based kind of practicum where students from Columbia would uh, live in this community, sort of like the settlement house movements that already existed, but instead of just kind of providing uh, community and education and resources for the community, they were sort of studying the community to kind of do this research in a any kind of uh, early example of anthropology course. So that's the program that they're going to do. Dewey's all about it because it's jobs for uh, his students. Some of them are going to get paid, and most notably Anzia as a uh, Polish woman she would be able to be their kind of fixer into the community it was thought she'd be the translator you know she would be an important part of the project plus john dewey was about to take his wife and go to san francisco where he was going to spend the month it was already arranged giving lectures at stanford uh while the students moved down here to a home on richmond street which dr barnes bought for the project put the students in there and had them start doing the work. Now, the thing about this project was it was a lot more complicated than uh, Barnes or Dewey had really thought about. Of course, anytime you're doing any project with communities and humans, uh, it often is more complicated than those on the outside who think we'll just go in and, and study them. And of course, in this community, there was a lot of outside interests that were agitating and um, bring politics for the sort of different ideas about what course uh, Poland would take after the war. And there was more sort of socialist intellectual worker leanings. There was more conservative forces that uh, sort of supported the czar before the war. Um, so all of that made it complicated and made a lot of people also clam up and not talk to outsiders unsure of course motivation. And there's also apparently uh, a real student difference on approach where some of the students wanted a more what they felt was scientific um, quantitative approach that sort of let's give out these surveys to the community. And others, including Anzio, uh, pushing for more qualitative, right? More uh, getting to know the, the community and, and getting to know their, their voices in a, in a narrative Way. So there's a lot of discord and Barnes is writing to Dewey and saying, can't wait for you to come back and uh, help us. Meanwhile, Dewey and Anzia are still writing these, these letters um, back and forth that uh, continue to show their uh, feelings for each other. She sees him as this heroic figure. He's released in her the freedom to create and to be, as she says uh, in a letter, how shall I ever make good to you my freedom? And yet I can think of no deeper happiness on earth than to be indebted to you. For his part, he answers her. I have your note, beautiful as your soul. While in my twilight, a beautiful garden with the brightness and perfume distilled from all the ages is suddenly opened to me. But even while he was writing those things, when it did come time to leave San Francisco, come back to Philadelphia, Dewey goes by way of British Columbia. So he takes his own sweet time getting back to Philadelphia. He's left his wife in San Francisco. And when he does come back, uh, first, he has to clean up the mess and the disagreements with the students, get, the, get a sort of semblance of the project. He gets back in mid-July, and they're trying to do a little more work on this project to give it focus. Uh, and then he meets with, with Anzia, and that's where he has to tell her uh, that he is not free to be with her. Right? He, he can't continue this uh, intensity. Now, the project keeps going. Barnes and Dewey uh, get more involved in the political side. They're writing up this report. They're trying to get it to people in Wilson's government. They feel like maybe they can make uh, a difference. So 
he's busy off doing that. And by September 1st, the project is really uh, over. The students are expanded. And Anzia is back in New York uh, and working as a, as a waitress and still still writing and still pining for, for Dewey. In the end of September, Dewey comes to, to Anzia in an episode that's really the, dr the dramatic climax of their uh, of, of their time together. And it's a scene that she describes at least twice in different books that she'll write in the future. Her daughter, uh, in a book her daughter wrote, suggests that it was a scene that um, she was obsessed with. That Anzi was obsessed with the scene and and always wanted to change the outcome, to make it right in her mind, uh, or sort of obsessively uh, playing it over and over. But in the scene, and this comes really from Anzia's description uh, that she's going to filter through creative creative fiction in the future. But in the scene, uh, they're walking. You know, they're having this 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 kind of bittersweet walk he's already told her or she's known you know that, that he's not free but as they're walking uh they're in the crowd and then it's just them right and he takes her hands and he's holding her hands and he's kissing her fingers and they're looking at each other uh in the slowly silvering sky the last pale tints of the sun's reflection drifted and died i mean this is her writing that she says he uh goes in for the kiss and he says to her do you, you, know, do you love me and she freezes she's shocked and of course he freezes he's shocked she's thinking wow this person is human not the heroic uh, muse but a real person and meanwhile he's of course thinking wow uh i'm embarrassed right i'm old i you know and he's 58 almost 59 she's 37 uh that's the uh, the kind of moment that's going on here uh they release you know drop the hands stand in quiet and he says um we should get back she says yes and he walks her back home here the next morning she comes to columbia she says she wants to make it right she's ready to throw herself as she says at his feet you know she wants to to, to rewind the clock uh but it's too late that already he is switched uh something has changed there's a wall uh, he's cold, he's businesslike, he says he's too busy to really talk to her, um, and that is a kind of wall that uh, Dewey will will hold, and um, very soon he goes back to California, uh, where his, his wife still has been there, and they go, what's going to be a sabbatical to Japan, turns into two years in Japan and China for Dewey before he returns to um, the United States. But before uh, Dewey goes, or at some point as he's as he's going, he helps place one of Anzia's stories in the New Republic, where he's a sometimes uh, contributor. Once that story is published, she has a spell of success getting multiple stories published a publisher comes and says hey you can write some more i'd like to print up a book of these short stories which she does it's a book called hungry hearts that then gets bought by hollywood and in 1921 she goes out to hollywood to write the film version for samuel goldwyn uh goldwyn and turns into a 1922 movie hungry hearts this is the title card um from that movie and what's interesting in this picture because she kind of get the idea but it's something that she would return to again and again in her fiction not just this this movie but the short stories and the novels she would go on to write where she was always going back to this kind of uh 
binary between the immigrant longing for something better, aspiring, creative, often a writer, wanting a better life, you know, needing a chance and opportunity, uh, and this established older figure um, in some stories, a high school teacher in another story, a college president, um, or a rich gentleman, you know, this kind of man who represents culture and um, he represents knowledge, but instead of holding the person out, he's in some ways a teacher or or building the bridges between these these um, communities. Uh, when the movie came, when this movie came out in 1922, she apparently did invite John Dewey to come to the screening. Um, so much of this, I think, she traced back to his uh, encouragement, you know, and then to have this story told um, that was from her experience. Um, but John Dewey apparently said that he was too busy uh giving a lecture at the time and would not be able to attend dewey and anzia did not see each other uh, again anzia went on to have some success some struggles some late life success as a writer dewey of course went on to a long career and was traveling and writing into his 90s much of this story probably would not be known, except that at some point uh, when he retired, it was 1930 from Columbia. I don't know if it was then. I know he was sort of a emeritus professor, so he probably had an office. Um, but at some point, a janitor was supposedly cleaning out the desk that Dewey had used and stuffed in some drawer or behind the drawer were these poems or a lot of the poems that Dewey had written. And um, uh, I know in the 70s, this book, I think, was was published, and it sort of led to folks uh, putting together some of these pieces and and shedding a light on this this story and, and Anzia that goes beyond just the project they did in Philadelphia, but this really creative uh, urgency that, that they shared. If there is an interesting postscript to the story, it may be that late... Uh, in uh, in in life, Columbia wanted to uh, raise money to create this statue, this bust of John Dewey that's that's on the campus, and uh, among the contributors was was Anzia. So thanks for watching. That's the uh, that's my presentation. I appreciate you checking out the Learnathon and this presentation. Um, Thank you for your support and also for your support of all the work that we do at Gratz College. We are definitely uh, grateful for that. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the Learnathon.